A complex operation to reopen the port of Baltimore after the deadly Francis Scott Key Bridge collapse. Several cranes, including the largest floating crane on the East Coast, arrived at the site. More vital equipment is on the way to remove debris on the nearly 100,000 ton cargo ship that rammed into the bridge on Tuesday. Wreckage has prevented divers from trying to recover the bodies of four of the victims. Nicole Skanga is in Baltimore. Nicole, good morning. Good morning, Michelle. The Army Corps of Engineers says it's nearly done sonar mapping the channel. Now, once that's done, the next step will be to cut the collapsed bridge into pieces and then lift all of that twisted steel and concrete out. A colossal crane capable of moving 1,000 tons, now poised to lift the wreckage of the Francis Scott Key Bridge. This crane that we're looking at is massive. The thing we also know is this, so is the challenge ahead of us. An estimated two to 3,000 tons of steel now sitting atop of the cargo ship Dolly. It's at least gonna get cut safely into four pieces and then we'll slowly and deliberately take it off the front of that vessel. Underway, seven floating cranes, 10 tugboats, nine barges, eight salvage vessels, and five Coast Guard vessels, a fleet tasked with clearing the 700 foot channel. The top priority for all the equipment that we're marshalling right here is going to be focused on clearing the channel. President Biden says he wants the full support of Congress in his effort to rebuild Baltimore's economic lifeline. Federal and state officials, including Maryland Governor Wes Moore, warned it is going to be a long road to recover from the loss. The state has already received $60 million in emergency relief funding. This week, Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg said rebuilding the bridge will not be quick or easy or cheap. Natalie Brand is outside the White House. Natalie, good morning. Good morning, Jeff. And President Biden says he plans to visit Baltimore next week. So far, as you mentioned, the administration has released that $60 million in emergency relief funds, but that's considered just a down payment for what will be a long and costly rebuild. It is not going to be days or weeks or months. This is going to take time. Engineers say it could take years to rebuild the Francis Scott Key Bridge. President Biden says he intends for the federal government to pay for it. So it could be 100 percent federally covered. That's correct. Maryland Senator Chris Van Hollen and his colleagues are working on legislation to make sure that happens. He says the cost could exceed a billion dollars. This is a project of national significance. The port has a national impact. This bridge is part of the interstate system. Uh, and so the way we've done this in the past is the countries come together, put aside politics, uh, and help support cities and states that are in need. And also making sure that the federal government gets credited for any funds that come in because of liability from the ship owners or others. The Department of Labor is also looking at options to help the estimated 15,000 workers directly employed by the Port of Baltimore. When there's no ships here, no cargo, there's no work. So it, it affects us greatly. We know you're there. We're gonna find a way to get you back to work in the meantime, companies this week, including top U.S. automakers, began rerouting shipments from one of the East Coast's busiest ports, which last year saw more than $80 billion in imports and exports. The impact is big right away, and it will grow over time. Now, the White House says its Supply Chain Disruption Task Force formed following the COVID-19 pandemic met twice this week to talk about impacts from the port's closure, especially given its normally high volume of automobiles, agriculture equipment and coal. They're trying to minimize any issues and believe overall the disruptions will be smaller than those caused by the pandemic. Dana. All right, Natalie, thank you. We start with that complicated cleanup operation underway in Baltimore as crews begin removing tons of wreckage from what used to be the Francis Scott Key Bridge. After that, teams will need to remove thousands of tons of debris from the cargo ship that crashed into the bridge and then pull out the ship's remains from the shipping channel. Only then can officials begin searching for the bodies of the four remaining construction workers. President Biden says he will visit the wreckage sometime next week. Here's CBS News senior transportation reporter Chris Van Cleve. The effort to clear away the wreckage of the Francis Scott Key Bridge and reopen the Port of Baltimore is getting a lift from the biggest floating crane on the East Coast. Now in Baltimore Harbor, it will be able to pick up pieces of debris weighing up to a thousand tons. 
I want this done quickly. I want it done right. But this is going to be a long road. Maryland Governor Wes Moore. Our economy depends on the Port of Baltimore, and the Port of Baltimore depends on vessel traffic. In the coming days, an armada of seven floating cranes, ten tugboats, nine barges, eight salvage vessels, and five Coast Guard ships will join the effort. In order to get the Port of Baltimore back open, they have to clear a 700-foot wide chunk of this channel, which means all of this debris has to go, and there's even more on the bottom of the channel. One of the priorities is removing the wreckage, preventing divers from recovering the bodies of the four construction workers still unaccounted for. Among them, father of three, Jose Lopez. His wife, Isabel Franco, speaking through an interpreter. I feel bad. Only God knows how hard my heart aches. Maybe he was desperate, trying to escape. New video from the NTSB takes us inside the crippled cargo ship Dolly, sitting frozen in the moment it collided with the bridge. Investigators have focused on gathering perishable evidence and interviewing the crew and boat pilots who were on board early Tuesday morning. While the data is still being analyzed, CBS News estimates when the more than 900-foot-long ship rammed into the bridge, it hit with at least the same force as the thrust generated by the launch of a Falcon 9 rocket. And Chris joins us now. So just on the boat alone, there's around 4,000 tons of bridge that needs to be removed. Chris, how do they go about cleaning up all that destruction that's there behind you? Well, that the piece uh, of truss that's resting on the ship, three mm -hmm. to 4,000 tons worth of steel, they're going to have to cut that into pieces because even this giant crane they brought in can only lift about 1,000 tons at a time. So it's exacting work. And remember, what we can see is only part of the debris. A lot of it has sunk down some 50 feet into this uh, completely almost midnight, dark, blackout water that they've got to go in and cut into pieces by hand. Divers will have to do that. So wow. it, it is a painstaking process. And the Army Corps of Engineers told us that every time they remove a piece, it changes the math on removing the rest. So it, it really sounds like a complicated effort that is going to take time. Yeah, a, a tremendous engineering problem. Uh, Chris, I'm also hoping you can talk to us about the effect that the collapse of the bridge has had, not only on the economy there, but on, as a nation, as a whole. Sure, so the, the Port of Baltimore is one of the nation's busiest. It is particularly busy for cars, coal, and sugar. Uh, those things cannot move in or out right now. There are ships in the harbor that can't get out, and there are cargo ships and cruise ships that can't get in. Uh, so you're, you have uh, a significant disruption uh, when, you, when you look at supply chain issues. Now, the, the ships will go to other ports, and things will get where they're, they're going eventually, but that's going to cause delays. And, of course, the things that needed to get out of this port will either have to be trucked or trained somewhere else. Otherwise, they're going to be sitting here for an unknown period of time. There's also the economic impact of the 8,000 people who work at the port, whose jobs are in limbo. And, and there's a push by the governor and some Maryland state lawmakers to pass some kind of payroll protection measure so that they at least have income coming in while they can't work because the port is shut down. All right. Chris Van Cleve in Sparrows Point, Maryland. Thank you. Workers are ramping up efforts to clean up the wreckage of the major bridge in Baltimore that collapsed earlier this week. What officials say is the largest crane in the eastern seaboard arrived for use in Baltimore today. Three heavy lift vessels are also being added to the site to help clear the water and reopen the port of Baltimore as quickly as possible. This crane that we're looking at is massive. The thing we also know is this. So is the challenge ahead of us. So in the coming weeks, we expect to have the following, the following entities inside of the water. Seven floating cranes, 10 tugs, nine barges, eight salvage vessels, and five Coast Guard boats. CBS News senior transportation correspondent Chris Van Cleve is in Baltimore for us. So Chris, tell us about the cleanup efforts happening at the collapse site today. 
Well, Elaine, ramping up is probably a good way to describe it. That crane got on site here in the overnight hours. Uh, and the Army Corps of Engineers, the commander of the Army Corps of Engineers, told us yesterday that they're still in the preparation stage. There's a, a lot of delicate math that has to be done uh, because apparently any piece uh, of wreckage they remove can uh, affect uh, everything else that's down there, and they need to be careful and precise about what they move when. Also, the first thing they'd like to do is get that piece of the bridge that's resting on the cargo ship removed but they think that weighs between three and four thousand tons that crane the the strongest floating crane on the east coast can only lift about a thousand tons at a time so they're going to have to cut that section into pieces and they have to do that carefully because of what it's resting on they also have to be careful about removing the weight off the ship because you know that's pushing the front of the ship down into the bottom of the channel. So this is delicate, complicated work uh, that's going to take a lot of prep time and also uh, uh, just sort of slow and steady work. Once it gets started, they expect it to be a 24-7 operation until it is complete, both at the surface of the water and with divers under the water, because there is a lot of debris that has sunk down some 50 feet into this almost midnight pitch black dark water uh, that's going to have to be cut into pieces that can be lifted out. It does sound incredibly complex, Chris. As you note, a lot of preparation, it sounds like, uh, still underway. And so even as that takes place, Chris, talk to us about the impact locally and nationally of the closure of this bridge. We have 8,000 people employed by a port that's essentially shut down because it's cut off from the ocean. Uh, we know there are a number of cargo ships uh, both on this side of the harbor that can't get out and a number of vessels in the Chesapeake Bay that can't get in. There are also two cruise ships that originated from here that aren't going to be able to get back here. So you have to figure out what to do with those cruise passengers and how you're going to reunite them with their vehicles and things parked here in Baltimore. Uh, so you have 8,000 people whose jobs, whose livelihoods are in limbo. And the state legislature here is looking at uh, legislation to uh, surge some emergency funding, some uh, basically payroll protection, if you will, for those workers. Uh, but this port's the one of the busiest in the country, the ninth busiest. Uh, it handles a lot of cars. It, it handles a lot of sugar, a lot of coal. Um, so not being able to get those things in, that will start to disrupt the supply chain depending on how long this goes on. Uh, cruise, ships, uh, cruise ships and cargo ships will be able to reroute to other ports. The Port of Savannah, uh, you go a little bit further up north to the, to the Port of Newark and the Port of New York, New Jersey. Uh, those are large ports that can take uh, some of this overflow, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a disruptor. Uh, and certainly the question is, how long will it take to clear that channel? It's a 700-foot channel that has to be cleared. Uh, and the, the, the commander of the Corps of Engineers said they have to clear every piece of debris, including everything on the bottom, because there's only about a foot to a foot and a half of clearance for those ships coming through. So anything left at the bottom could be a potential hazard to, to those ships as they come and go. An enormous undertaking. Chris Van Cleef for us. Chris, thank you. The Port of Baltimore is one of the busiest ports in the world, and the collapse of the Key Bridge has shut down vessel traffic to the port. Trade Point Atlantic immediately began mobilizing and accepting some cargo ships from vessels that were bound from the Port of Baltimore, immediately began preparing for those arrivals, and they accepted their first shipment of cargo bound for the port just yesterday. We will continue working closely with their team and we are grateful for their support and grateful for their leadership. Now, today I will provide updates on the four directives I've issued to our team. As a reminder, the directives are, first, we need to continue to focus on recovery because we have to bring a sense of closure to these families. Second, we need to be clear, we need to clear the channel and open the vessel traffic to the port because the health of the Maryland economy and the national economy depend on it. Third, we need to take care of all the people who have been affected by this crisis. That means the families, that means the workers, that means the businesses, 
That means the first responders. That means everybody. And fourth, we need to and we will rebuild the key bridge. So first, on our recovery efforts. As I mentioned yesterday, we need to do more work clearing the channel to move forward. This is a remarkably complex operation, and our focus needs to be on unity of command and unity of effort. Every morning, we have a unified command briefing, which includes state police, the U.S. Coast Guard, the Army Corps of Engineers, our federal delegation, and other leaders who are central to this mission. Now, during that briefing, Colonel Butler, the superintendent of the Maryland State Police, discussed that the conditions in the water makes it unsafe for divers. But as soon as those conditions change, his divers will go back in the water. Second, on clearing the federal channel and opening vessel traffic to the port. As of this morning, I've been briefed by the Maryland Department of Transportation on clearing wreckage and moving forward. Our team went out with the Coast Guard just a few hours ago, including the, Clo the Coast Guard Commandant, to survey the damage, to see the wreckage up close, to see a freight that is nearly the size of the Eiffel Tower, and to see that same freight with the key bridge resting on top of it, to see shipping containers that were ripped in half as if they were paper mache, to know that out there you have to navigate high winds and electric wires, to go out there and to see it up close, you realize just how daunting a task this is. You realize how difficult the work is ahead of us. With a salvage operation this complex and frankly, with a salvage operation this unprecedented, you need to plan for every single moment and every time you take action to move a piece of wreckage, you understand that that requires you to reassess the situation. So when I led soldiers in combat, I knew that preparation was everything. You do not go into the field of battle without getting the intelligence that you need first. So as the mission continues, you need to stay frosty, you need to reassess, and you need to adapt. That's the mindset the Army Corps is applying with their partners in Unified Command. We have the best inspectors, the best surveyors, and the best engineers in the world working and setting up and executing a plan of action right here in Maryland. And I've been informed by the U.S. Navy that they are supplying us with four heavy lift cranes Two have already arrived, one arrives tonight, and the fourth is arriving on Monday. One of the cranes is called the Chesapeake 1000, and it can lift about 1,000 tons. But the big part, and one of the challenges, is that the key bridge, which sits on top of the vessel right now, that that weight is somewhere between three and 4,000 tons. So our team needs to cut that trust into sections in a safe, in a responsible, and in an efficient way before it can lift those pieces out of the water. This crane that we're looking at is massive. The thing we also know is this. So is the challenge ahead of us. So in the coming weeks, we expect to have the following, the following entities inside of the water. Seven floating cranes, 10 tugs, nine barges, eight salvage vessels, and five Coast Guard boats. I've said it before, I will say it again, and I will keep on saying it. This is not just about Maryland. This mission is not just about Maryland. And what we're talking about today is not just about Maryland's economy. This is about the nation's economy. The port handles more cars and more farm equipment than any other port in this country. At least 8,000 workers on the docks have jobs that have been directly impacted by this collapse. Our economy depends on the port of Baltimore and the port of Baltimore depends on vessel traffic. 
Maryland's economy and Maryland's workers rely on us to move quickly. But that's not just Maryland. The nation's economy and the nation's workers are requiring us to move quickly. Third, on taking care of our people. I want to talk a little bit about the work that we're doing with the Maryland legislature. I want to thank Speaker Adrian Jones, Senate President Bill Ferguson, and Minority Leader Steve Hershey. They have been in touch with our team since day one. I also want to thank Delegate Luke Clippinger, Senator Johnny Ray Sailing, and other members of the District 6 and District 46 teams. And I want to thank all of the Maryland legislators who have reached out and offered their support. Legislators, frankly, on both sides of the aisle. And I want to thank our federal delegation, too, to include Jamie Raskin, who was here earlier, but, uh, but unfortunately cannot be here now. But to the members of the Maryland General Assembly, we know this. We are 10 days away from the conclusion of this legislative session, and there is a lot of work to do. The top priority in that work is going to be finalizing our budget. My administration proposed a responsible budget that makes important investments in housing and child care and environmental protection and transportation. So now it is vital that the House and the Senate find compromise as soon as possible pass the budget and provide certainty at this challenging and uncertain time. We also need to ensure that we pass legislation to support the families and the victims of the bridge collapse and everyone else who has been affected by this emergency. I'll be proposing the creation of a permanent state scholarship for the children of surviving spouses of transportation workers who lost their lives on this job. We will continue to push for legislation that seeks to protect workers like the six victims of the Key Bridge collapse. I've also asked the General Assembly to ensure that any legislation we work on provides the flexibility our administration needs to support port workers, businesses, and our transportation network. We cannot possibly find every answer to every problem in the next few days before session ends, but we can give the state the ability to respond over the coming months. Fourth, on rebuilding. As I said yesterday, we cannot rebuild the bridge until we have cleared the wreckage. I've always believed that you never learn anything about anybody when times are easy. If you really want to understand someone's mettle, Watch them when it's hard. Watch them when it's difficult. Watch them when the stakes are high. Well, that time is now. And we are going to rise to meet this moment. Because we are Maryland tough and because we are Baltimore strong. So, in this moment, I'm going to hand it off to the U.S. Coast Guard over to Admiral Gilreath. And then after that, We'll be briefed by Colonel Pinkachin from the uh, uh, P Pinchasen from the Army Corps of Engineers, the Maryland State Police, the Maryland Department of Transportation, EPA Administrator Ortiz, Congressman, Congressman Kwasi and Fume, and County Executive Johnny Olszewski. Alan Gilroy. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. I'm Rear Admiral Shannon Gilreath speaking on behalf of the Unified Command. As I mentioned last night, our number one priority of the Unified Command is to reopen the Port of Baltimore. And to do that, we've broken that into three phases. Number one phase is reopen the shipping channel. Number two is remove the ship. And number three is to remove the debris from the bridge from the rest of the waterway. We are beginning to make progress on those phases. In the phase one, we talked about that we need to do the assessments of the bridge, both above the waterline and beneath the water. Those assessments continue. As the governor said, we were out there today and we could see the engineers and the divers and the 
survey boats out there on the water in these difficult wind conditions doing their job, doing their work to assess that bridge to figure out how we can cut it up into the pieces we need to be able to lift. And back at the Unified Command, the governor, the commandant, all the elected officials, they could see those engineers working on those very plans. Engineers from the Army Corps of Engineers, Navy Supervisor of Salvage. We had state engineers there. There were some private engineers helping us. And we had some Coast Guard engineers there. And they're all working diligently to figure out that right plan to be able to break that bridge up into the right size pieces that we can lift. And the second part of that is we need to get the heavy lift equipment here. And we've been telling you that those cranes are on their way and that equipment's on that way. And behind us, you can see the first of those things that are arriving. They're arriving and they're gonna to continue to arrive for the next several days. And we're gonna continue that planning so that we will be ready to be able to take advantage of that as soon as possible and do it safely. I'll turn it over to Colonel Pinchason. Governor Moore, elected officials, thank you so much for having us here. Uh, as we just transition to the most critical mission that we have to open and restore the channel, to clear the shipping channel and open the port of Baltimore, we've now begun surveying and conducting engineer analysis and assessing in order for us to conduct the integrated salvage operations within the channel and also to refloat the vessel as well as <clears throat> remove the wreckage of the bridge. However, the top priority for all the equipment that we're marshalling right here is gonna be focused on clearing the channel. Now that doesn't happen overnight, and the work that our team is doing is just phenomenal. I can't say enough about the team that we've assembled here. Kinda had a little bit of a dress rehearsal when we did the Ever Forward, and that's the same team that we have on the ground. That industry muscle memory, that incredible wealth of knowledge, expertise, skills, experience, all those lessons are being applied here and it's a really powerful partnership. I can't say enough about what those folks are doing. We should all be super proud to see state, federal partners, DOD partners coming together. It should give the Baltimore, the Port of Baltimore, the people of Baltimore, the state of Maryland and our nation so much confidence to know that they have the right people here to execute this mission. We're gonna be doing that safely and as quickly as possible. So with that, sir, I'll turn it over. Thanks. Sir. 